Yeah, um, there's her little pot. <coughs> I, oh, love, Mr. Charles. I love that little corner of the picture because the pot is so real and tactile and smooth and cool and it's half silhouetted against this black void mm. which for me is a, a symbol or an echo of the tomb and a symbol of the death of Christ and her little pot is somehow symbolizing her eternal presence. But this little corner of the picture there encapsulates the whole story. Mm. This is like a Malievich black square. Mm. <laughs> it's got all of that, that I I eternity <laughs> to it. And the beautiful breaking light at the back, it's Venice over at the back because Savoldo um, works in the Veneto in Venice with that beautiful light and so the light that's shining on her which I only can think of one word to describe it it's, it really is a silvery light mm. the lights that really caressing her and, and we know it's the same story as with the Titian she's been weeping by the tomb believing the love of her life to be dead and this is the moment of recognition and I can't explain theologically, Jenny, why it is that we are put in the position of Christ, that she is looking up at us mm -hmm. um, with that recognition. And you can see she's been crying because her mascara has been smudged around her eyes, a beautiful detail. And, and like she's got her hand in her sleeve as if she's doing what all fallen women do. She's been wiping her nose, wiping her eyes on her sleeve. I think it's quite interesting in this time period how artists take biblical subjects, for example, the Annunciation. If you think of Antonella da Messina, has the Virgin looking up from her prayers and we are put in the position of the angel Gabriel. We are delivering that news. Um, that's something that artists become fascinated with towards the end of the 15th into the 16th century. And the idea that she's looking up and in some senses we are the revelation or we are bringing the revelation to her in this painting. Um, and the beautiful seam is so important as well. Yeah. Such a crucial moment in the picture, the join of that fabric. Again, it works on, on a, a, an abstract level. I mean, we're, we're living in the 21st century. We've had Mondrian, we've had Malievich, we've had all these artists who convey spiritual values through abstraction. And I think Savoldo is actually doing that in exactly the same way in various parts of the picture. I think he's thinking about time. I mean, as you mentioned, Colin, this is a key moment where she's just looking up from her tears and she's clearly responding to something before, be perhaps before she's even seen it. She's sensed a present, presence. But um, the way you were talking about the architecture, that, as you rightly point out, you can only sort of just make out in the background um, that you see exposed bricks that were once had a certain kind of facing that is now you know, plaster that's kind of fallen away. And then beyond that, you see an additional kind of ruinous architecture, um, which to me look, reminds me of those kind of Hadrianic buildings, the Canopus mm -hmm. <laughs> and that sort of thing. So if you imagine these are pagan buildings that are crumbling, that trees are growing through, that is the pagan past. And as you move forward, you come into the Christian present as you move forward in mm -hmm. time. So an artist who thinks about depth, as time, perhaps, as a quite interesting idea, which of course suggests that the present is exactly where we are standing. And that, that made me think um, um, how you might read this painting in particular, because you think about your audience, <laughs> and you place your audience in a very particular way in some ways. You know, you have a certain story that you want them to tell, that you want to tell them. You well, I think one of them. the things that's so important in performance is we always want to be with people at their moment of recognition. We want to be with people at the moment when they realize something. Mm, that's very nice. And this, and their moment of discovery. And I think this painting gives us, as you said, I mean, it's where we actually end the other Mary. The last words are when Jesus says, Mary, Mary. And someone's calling her name. And she looks, and she sees Jesus. Mm. And I think Savoldo is, you know, one of the, I think one of the most beautiful things is Jesus is the gardener, Jesus is the janitor, Jesus is the person who's bringing in the water bottle, Jesus is the service 
person wherever you are. Mm -hmm. And that beautiful thing of looking up and realizing the person you're looking at is Jesus. So look at everyone and realize they're Jesus is such a beautiful, as you said, Colin, what this picture has in it. And you feel this is her shroud. And you feel that shroud will live, is about to lift. And you, you feel that she's buried in this. Mm -hmm. And it's been painted with such elaborate attention to detail, both light and dark, both the, the, the lost in sin, as you said, as of, of the, the, the wiping hand, but also this you know, beautiful uh, silver, you know, the beginnings, the ends of some kind of moonlight. Mm. And, 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 and then this just slight burn in the red clouds, mm -hmm. which gives you the slight burn of the red dress that's the traditional Magdalene dress, but that's about to burn off as that's about to burn off. All of that is about to be shed as the day breaks and as we go into a new place and you feel that sunrise in her eyes and you feel that the beginning of the new dawn of recognition, of revelation, and it, it's just, again, it's incipient. The sun hasn't appeared over the horizon yet. It's that moment just before, as you said, that is so, that is so pregnant. I love, see, I couldn't see in the reproductions all the detail of this stuff, which is thrilling because it shows you that the grave, which we think of as permanent and final, is an improvised mess. <laughs> You know, it's actually some stuff slapped onto this and then that moved on, and that will be redone later, and then it will be dug. You know, there's something so impermanent about the grave here. Mm, that's man -made. And we, exactly, and we think of the, the, a tomb as, as a kind of, some kind of finality, and this is so temporary, improvised, and as you said here, Colin, I mean, I can't help but see these trees, which have foliage, and this tree, which is the fig tree that was that Jesus cursed, that said, will never produce. Mm. And this strange, desiccated tree behind her of an image of death and an image of non-productivity. And then this beautiful expression, as you said, <laughs> the smear and the blur of the old life, and then the clarity of vision of the new life. And, uh, the times, the time that that, idea, that look is just coming to us at this very second is so astonishing mm -hmm. and reaches out through all those layers. It's really a, I, I, nothing prepared me for this. And this, this I think is so much a picture for our generation because it, it's such a, a minimalist picture mm -hmm. and it fits with so much with the sensibilities that we've been brought up with. Mm -hmm. and, and that direct address uh, that we're yeah. so used to now, you know, in the way that we communicate. And now you really have to come to the other Mary because what we're trying to do is, of course, re reimagine each of these images in a situation that has a reality and spiritual imminence today. And uh, one of the great things that we're able to do is work with living bodies. So they have their own presence and power, but one of the things that's surprising to the singers is I keep wanting them to stay in certain positions for a while. So we actually mm. get the sense that there are these moments where people are processing, but also where we can process what they're processing. Because none of these actions are meant to be complete in themselves. They're all meant to point you to another larger action to another deeper question. And we all need that moment of stillness to enter those spaces. Right. It just struck me when you were talking about um, staging your actors and having them say, stay put in one place. And what we were talking about in front of the Sebastiano, where that one gesture, that, or even in the Titian, the way you incline your body, that's the story before you even say anything. That relationship, you have to set up a, a series of relationships between those living bodies. And what paint does, of course, is also what music does. And the music goes beyond words. Yes. Like, fully. Yep. And yep. John Adams' music goes way beyond anything you can say. You do not know why you're feeling the things you're feeling, and you cannot imagine why you're understanding the things you're understanding. And you don't know how you're understanding them, or what it even is you're understanding. Mm -hmm. And it remains intangible, 
and at the same time it's right in front of you and surrounding you and is immersive. You know, and I think the way in which this becomes an immersive experience, you know, he really makes you go into it. Mm, you're you, you really, you, you are presence. right there. Yeah. And, and it's like, hello. I like the idea of all of these languages operating simultaneously. So the language of paint, the language of music, and the language that we communicate with our bodies without it, before we even say anything. And the layering of all of these must be extraordinary. In your well, I think opera. that's the thrill of opera, is mm -hmm. you, it's the dream of opera is all these art forms coming together. That visual art, dance, poetry, music, and architecture are all come together to create meaning. Mm. And a meaning that is alive because it's being handed back and forth across those art forms. And that becomes, like reality itself, composite. And these composite realities, mm. which are constantly shifting, because if one element shifts, everything shifts, uh, is what we're always hoping for on a good day with opera.